Welcome to my operations management video on product design. I'll also briefly touch on service design, although I have a separate video on that. The essence of an organization is the goods and services it offers. Every aspect of the organization is structured around delivering them, marketing them, and producing them. Product or service design, or product or service redesign, should be closely tied to the organization's strategy. And we talked about organizational strategy in an earlier video. We tend to think about products and services as two separate categories, black or white, male or female, up or down. However, that's just not the case. Rather, products and services are really just two extremes on a continuum that goes from full products to full services. A steel mill is pretty much a product with no service component. Mars is pretty much a service with no manufacturing component. However, take Dell Computer. They manufacture computers. It's closer to the product side of things but they do provide technical support, which is a service. Take McDonald's. We think about them as a service, but they do manufacture hamburgers, french fries, and Cokes. So many manufacturing operations have service characteristics. Many service delivery facilities have manufacturing characteristics. Product design specifies the materials to be used, determines dimensions and tolerances, defines the appearance of the product, and sets the standards of performance. Service design specifies what physical items, that's the hamburgers and french fries, essential benefits, that's the smell, and physiological benefits, that's hunger station, the customers to receive from the service. Generating new product ideas is the most important thing a company can do, or service ideas for a service company. All products will eventually decline and die. Companies like Smith Corona used to make great typewriters. A typewriter is just a keyboard hooked up straight to the printer with no computer in the middle. Companies used to make great record players. That's a very old MP3 player. Both of those products are essentially dead now. So if a company doesn't have new products waiting in the pipeline, when their products die, the company dies. The market can drive the product that you're designing. Currently, the market is aiming towards SUVs and not sedans. New ideas can come from outside the company, market research, looking to see what your competitors are doing, reading industry publications. A new product can also create the marketplace. Chrysler invented the minivan. Before that, full-size vans were something that were used by plumbers and electricians, and if you had a family, you used a station wagon. After the minivan, station wagons pretty much died. The minivan created a whole new market. New ideas can also come from within the company. The most likely sources are marketers and engineers. I did some research, and just to give you some averages, only about 5% of ideas actually make it to the marketplace. Think about all the people out there trying to write the great American novel, or all the bands out there trying to succeed, or all the YouTube people trying to become YouTube stars. Of those that make it to the market, only about 10% are successful. So only one half of 1% of all of the new product ideas are successful. Most movies, even well-known movies, don't make a profit. Most bands don't recover their advances when they release a new album. Even though you've got such a low probability of being successful, again, if your product dies and you don't have a replacement, the company dies, so you have to do this. I watched a television show about McDonald's, and I wrote these notes down. I find them astounding. McDonald's has a test kitchen that generates 1,800 new ideas each year for their restaurants. One day on the way to work, I tried to think of new ideas for McDonald's. There is no way I could have come up with 1,800, or even 180. Of those 1,800, only about two to three make it to the stores. The average time from it being a new idea to it showing up in a restaurant is two years. If it was successful, it would have gone through 200 or more tests. Still, McDonald's has had some spectacular failures. If you haven't heard of these, Google them because they are real McDonald's products. The Arch Deluxe, they spent $100 million advertising it. It was supposed to be a hamburger for just adults, kind of like Tricks or for kids. The McLean, during the low-fat craze, it was a hamburger that actually had some of the fat removed and replaced with seaweed, and no, I'm not kidding. And the McPizza, I ate the Arch Deluxe, it wasn't bad. I ate the McLean, I actually liked it. I've never seen or heard of the McPizza. The major factors when you're doing a product design are, what's it going to cost? What level of quality are you going to produce? And that's the difference between a Honda and a Kia, for example. How long is it going to take you to get it to the market? The level of customer satisfaction you're looking for? And what kind of a competitive advantage can you get from your new product? As always, you want it to tie in closely with your strategy. If your strategy is to be the low-cost provider, you don't want to be producing a high-quality product. So why might you design a new product or redesign an existing product? or service for that matter. If the economic situation is changing, for example, we're in an economic downturn now due to the pandemic. If you're producing a very expensive item, you're going to want to look to cut costs. If society or the demographics are changing, the American population is getting older. If you watch television, you're seeing more and more ads for products aimed at older people. There can be political, liability, or legal issues that you have to redesign things. Competitive reasons, your competitors are going another way and you need to keep up with the competition. 
Cost or availability if your cost of your product's too high or you can't keep up with demand. And if technology's changing, you wouldn't have much success selling a five-year-old cell phone now. The major focus when you go to design a new product or a service for that matter is satisfying your customers. And in order to do that, you've got to understand what your customers want. And that's really the job of marketing. Some secondary considerations in terms of designing a new product or service. What's the function of it? What price point are you trying to reach? How much profits are you trying to reach? What quality level are you looking for? What do you want it to look like? You want it to be easy to produce, at least if you're producing it yourself. And if it's something that needs to be maintained, like a car, you want it to be easy to maintain. There are also some legal, ethical, and environmental issues that you have to consider. In terms of legal, depending on the product or service, there's the Food and Drug Administration, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and to a lesser degree, the Internal Revenue Service. There's product liability issues you have to be concerned with, and there's the Uniform Commercial Code. In terms of ethical issues, you don't want to release a product with defects. For environmental issues, if you're producing it yourself, you need to be concerned about the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Don't want to violate pollution rules while you make your product. Product liability. A manufacturer is liable for any injuries or damages caused by a faulty product, and you can't waive away this requirement with some sort of liability waiver. The Uniform Commercial Code says that products carry an implicit guarantee of merchantability and fitness. In other words, it says that the product does what you say it's going to do. There are guidelines that designers have to adhere to. They include having product designs that are consistent with the goals of the company, giving customers the kind of value they expect from the company and the product, making health and safety a primary concern that's both for your customers and your workers, and considering potential harm to the environment. Other issues you have to think about include the product life cycle. Is it still in the growth phase or is it in decline phase? How much standardization are you going to have in the production? Are you going to do mass customization? What type of reliability are you looking for? Are you looking for a robust design? The degree of newness that it has? And the cultural differences? We'll talk about each of these. As you know from your marketing class, products or services exhibit a life cycle over time. The product is introduced. If it fails, it goes away. If it succeeds, it goes through rapid growth. Eventually it matures. All products mature. This is where demand growth slows down. Demand is still growing, but its rate of growth is slower. Finally, it declines. And then, as we've talked about, it dies. It gets replaced by something else. How quickly or slowly that happens depends on the product or service. It can be long. It can be short. Standardization is the extent to which there is an absence of variety in a product, service, or process. So if I was a car company, I'd only have a couple of engines, a couple of transmissions, a couple of sets of brakes, lots of standardized products, and just build different vehicles out of them. Standardized products are immediately available to customers because I don't have to go through the design customization. Standardization means that I need to stock fewer parts both in inventory and for manufacturing. Think about the difference in inventory for a car company if every car had a different engine versus if they all had one or two engines. Design costs are generally lower because there are standard components I'm not having to look at. I have reduced training costs for my assemblers and my repairmen, simplified purchasing, handling and inspection procedures, and more consistent quality. Additionally, orders are fillable from inventory. I have the opportunity for longer production runs and automation and taking advantage of the learning curve. The need for fewer parts justifies increased expenditures on perfecting designs and improving quality control procedures, especially for those standardized parts. There are also some disadvantages. If I freeze the design too early, I may freeze in imperfections. If I use the parts all over the place, the high cost of making a design change increases resistance to making improvements, especially small incremental improvements. And decreased variety results in less consumer appeal. How likely are you to buy another car if you've only got a choice between two or three engines? Now let's look at some terms. Mass customization. A strategy of producing standardized goods or services, but incorporating some degree of customization. Delayed differentiation. The process of producing, but not quite completing a product or service until the customer preferences are known. This is a t-shirt shop. They have a bunch of white t-shirts on the premise and different designs, but they don't iron the designs on the t-shirt until you make your selection. Modular design, a form of standardization which component parts are grouped into modules that are easily replaced or interchangeable. Desktop computers with power supplies and hard drives that can be swapped out. Reliability, the ability of a product, part, or system to perform its intended function under a prescribed set of circumstances. That prescribed set of circumstances is important. That's not taking your Honda Civic out on Baja. It's not using your SUV as an Uber vehicle. Failure, a situation in which a part, product, or system 
does not perform as intended. It doesn't have to completely quit working. It just doesn't work as intended. So this could be your car with the air conditioner not working. Normal operating conditions. The set of conditions under which an item's reliability is specified. So how do you improve reliability? Well, you can design better components. You can do a better job of producing them and assembling them. You can do more testing of the product as you produce it and once it's finished. You can have redundancies and backups. Well, what is that? If the brakes on your car go out, the parking brake still works. It uses an entirely different system, so that's a redundant backup. If your primary brakes fail, your backup parking brakes still work. You can have good preventative maintenance, getting your oil changed frequently, for example. Educate your users on how to use the product and do a good systems design. A robust design is a design that results in products or services that can function over a broad range of conditions. This would be the difference between a standard sedan and a police sedan. Being robust always increases reliability. In terms of newness, there is modifications of an existing product or service, expansion of an existing product or service, clone of a competitor's product or service, and a new product or service. When you modify an existing product, its degree of newness to the firm is low, and its degree of newness to the market is low. When you expand a product, its newness to the firm is low, and its newness to the market is low. When you clone a product that somebody else is making, its newness to the firm is high, but its newness to the market is low. When you come out with a new product, the newness to the firm is high, and the newness to the market is high. Multinational companies must take into account cultural differences related to product design. For example, I've spent a good bit of time in Cameroon, Africa. I've even toured a Coca-Cola factory in Cameroon, Africa. They don't sell Diet Coke in Cameroon. There's no obesity problem. There's just no demand for it. That's just a cultural difference. Failing to take that into account can cause some real failures. The typical example that everyone gives is the Chevy Nova in Mexico, where Nova means no-go in Spanish. There are nine phases in the product development process. Step number one is you generate the idea. This could be for a new product, to modify an existing product, to build off of a competitor's product. You do a feasibility analysis to see if it makes sense for your company. Just because it makes sense for the marketplace doesn't mean it makes sense for your company. You may not have the production facility. If you decide to go ahead, you do the product specifications. What are all the characteristics that the product's going to have? Then you design the production process. Then you develop a prototype. A lot of companies are now doing this completely on the computer. You review that uh, design. And again, a lot of companies are doing this on the computer as well. Then you do a test market, although companies are starting to skip that now. Part of the reason they skip it is that with so much communication and uh, social media, their test market can get out to their competitors. Then you introduce the product. Then you do a follow-up of it to make sure it's successful and doesn't need any changes. Reverse engineering. The dismantling and inspection of a competitor's product to discover product improvements. You can bet that some of the early iPhones go to their competitors to take apart. It's not always legal. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act prohibits it, but companies still do it. Let's talk about R&D, research and development. Research is an organized effort to increase scientific knowledge or product innovation. Basic research advances knowledge about a subject without near-term expectations of commercial applications. This is almost always either done by a university or with a government grant. Applied research achieves commercial application. Development converts results of applied research into commercial applications. Manufacturability is the ease of fabrication and our assembly. This is important for cost. The easier it is to manufacture, the more productive you can be. Quality. For services, we call it serviceability. Design for manufacturing is the designer's consideration of the organizational's manufacturing capabilities when designing a product. This is more of an issue if you're going to make it yourself. If you're going to outsource it, then you find a manufacturer capable of producing what you need to produce. The more general term of design for operations encompasses services as well as manufacturing. Concurrent engineering is bringing together the engineering design and manufacturing personnel early in the design phase. So while you're designing the product, you're designing the manufacturing and the packaging and the marketing rather than doing one and then the next and then the next. This lets you get it to the marketplace quicker. Design for assembly is a design that focuses on reducing the number of parts in a product and on assembly methods and sequences, part of making it easier to manufacture. Design for recycling is a design that facilitates the recovery of material and components in used products for reuse. This is not such a big deal here, but it's a major consideration in Europe. Remanufacturing is refurbishing used products by replacing worn out or defective components. There are websites, for example, that sell refurbished computers. Dell has a whole website devoted to that. Design for disassembly is a design so that used products can be easily taken apart as part of the recycling process or the refurbishing process. 
Recycling is recover material for future use. Recycling can save costs, help the environment, and is sometimes required by environmental regulations. It's one of the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. We talked about standardization, but we can also use component commonality. That's where multiple products or product families that have a high degree of similarity can share components. So even if a car company can't share engines, they might can share water pumps and distributors. This reduces the training for assembly and installation, reduces repair time and cost, reduces the inventory you have to stock, reduces design time, has a lot of benefits. The quality function deployment is called the voice of the customer. It's also called a house of quality. It's an approach that integrates the voice of the customer into the product and service development phase. Here you see an example of a house of quality, and I know it's too small for you to really read. I'm sure your textbook has a better example. These are broken down into six broad areas, the design requirements, and then the correlation matrix shows the relationship between the different requirements. Is there a strong or weak or no relationship? The customer requirements, a relationship matrix, showing the relationship between the customer requirements and the design requirements, a competitor analysis, although sometimes that's left off, and in fact the example I showed you earlier left that off, and then the company specifications or target values and how well they're meeting them. If you enjoyed this video, please click like and consider subscribing to this channel.